I've got a lot of words on my slides and that's the main reason for that is I got up at three o'clock this morning and jumped on a plane and so I'm going to need some words because I still haven't had a coffee. Um, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm not a forest guy, but I, yeah, I do plan forestry every now and then. Look, one of the things I really love about what Catherine said is, you know, we've got to look at a broader set of signals. The other thing that I think we need to do when we're making decisions is we need to actually improve the signals we're actually using. And what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes is just some really, really, it's very, very meat potatoes after, after Catherine's read a great introduction sort of thing, about how we can actually use economics a little bit better than what we have been doing to bring in some of those other values. And some of the consequences and some of the lessons it's actually sort of telling us about forestry management. Um, so I'm going to look at multiple values and so forth. Um, I've got to talk a little bit about how an economist thinks for a couple of minutes, and apologies, it's kind of like doing a degree in about two minutes, and you probably won't like it, but I'm going to make you listen anyway. Um, I'm then just going to do a couple of case studies. Um, one is actually where we've actually had a look at sort of the value of, of, of forest estates beyond thinking the commercial sort of forestry sort of practices and how do they compare and how can we go and do that sort of thing. The other one is I'm then actually going to do a quick little case study on how we might sort of consider changes in forestry tenure and so forth and using existing tools, but how we can do that a little bit better. Um, and then some potential observations. I'm trying to keep it really practical because, you know, at the end of the day, we've got a big journey to go ahead, but we've got to take it one step at a time. Okay, how might economists think about the value of forests? Um, Traditionally, we sort of have the total economic value sort of framework and things like that. And, you know, economists, we're like accountants that do, that do calculus. We like to put things in boxes. Um, and we go and we, do, we value this and we value that and we value other things. And, you know, I've been doing this for a long time sort of thing. And, yeah, sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's not. And a lot of times it's not. Because most of the work that I do and our group does is we actually sit there and we're partnering with biophysical scientists and social scientists and engineers and other disciplines and things like that. And we need to work out how to join the dots. How do we actually join the dots from those disciplines? How do we start thinking across the disciplines and making some more holistic and actual you know, realistic decisions and so forth? Um, so the thing that I really like is sort of the ecosystem services framework and Catherine sort of touched on it briefly sort of thing. As an economist, when I sort of came across this, it was a bit of a eureka moment because all of a sudden I could start having those conversations with other disciplines. And we could start talking about similar things and the linkages and the relationships, the cause and effect relationships and all those sorts of things. You know, typically we have our provisioning services and regulating and social and cultural and supporting. You've probably all come across that a million times before, so I won't talk about it too long. Um, this is a bit of a horrendous diagram about how, how a simple economist like me thinks about joining the dots. And we typically start off with, think about some natural capital, think about an asset. I like to think about forests as, as an asset. And it's, you know, if we're, you know, it's one of those things I keep on saying, if we treated natural capital like an asset, we'd actually, be, we'd actually manage it because just like we manage all the built in infrastructure and so forth. We go and paint buildings, we, we do repairs and maintenance, we do all those sorts of things. We maintain the services that come from that. We maintain the quality of, of the asset and so forth and the serviceability. We don't tend to do that with nature because of market failure and all those, all those things that we learn about in, in our economics degrees. So I like to sort of start off with, you know, in this case, we've got a state forest and we do some forest management. And that forest management can include extraction and all those other things. And that has two, two, two broad types of effects. One's about it changes the extent, the other one's about it changes the, the condition. Both of those things actually have an impact on the ecosystem services that we get out of the forest. So there's nothing new here. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing most of you guys are probably biophysical scientists, so this is all pretty familiar to you. Then the economists get very, very excited and we try and put values on all those, all those different things. And I think that's still a very legitimate thing to do because we still live in a market economy. But how do we make that market economy work better? The other thing that we've been getting really interested in a lot of the work that we're doing, and this gets to that sort of distribution type of issue as well, who benefits from all these different services? And how do we get that co-investment? How do we get that co-management coming into the system? 
And understanding those beneficiaries is really, really useful to do that because, you know, where do we need joined up effort? You know, where, where are the gaps in the effort and so forth? And one of the great things is we're also starting to see markets emerging for environmental services and so forth as well. Um, we spend a bit of our time sort of doing, talking to bankers and things like that. They're all trying to go, we're actually really worried about sort of climate change and natural capital and natural disasters and all these sorts of things. And we're sort of realising, you know, when we actually lend somebody some money, it's linked to somebody, some economic, it's linked to some economic activity that is both contingent on the ecosystem services, but also impacts on ecosystem services. And so they're really scratching their heads and it's great they've sort of come to the table, but they're really scratching their heads in terms of how do they actually mainstream <coughs> nature, natural capital into their business. And that's what we need to be sort of doing more and more of. But by going through that sort of process of having a look at that distribution, we can start identifying the potential investors. And I'm using economic sort of language deliberately, but think about co-collaborators as well. Economists, we're a bit like Bob the Builder. Um, you've got to have the right tool for the job. Um, markets are good at valuing some things, and markets are really, really bad at valuing other things. And that's often because if we think about nature, it's generally not traded in market systems or anything like that. You know, you can't go down to the 7-Eleven and buy a unit of biodiversity or a unit of recreation or anything like that. And we need to come up with other ways of actually doing it. For the last 50 odd years, economists have been running around trying to work out how to do this. And basically, you, know, you end up with a whole bunch of different methods to actually do it. If we start thinking about the forestry estate and so forth, we've got a whole bunch of different values to try and understand those values, we've got to start using a whole bunch of different types of valuation methods. And they're slowly getting better and better and better. And some of them are based on market transactions. Some of them are sort of the defence expenditure um, that Catherine was talking about. So, you know, often when we have a look at damage to environment, what's the cost of actually fixing it? What's the alternatives and so forth? Productivity-based approaches, non-market approaches. We do a lot of work in travel cost. And, you know, think about that as, you know, we, we go to recreate in a forest on my, on my mountain bike ride. Glad to see that photo up there. Um, but what's the value of that? You know, it's got to be worth at least the cost of getting there and actually undertaking the activity. Otherwise, I wouldn't bother. I'd stay at home, sit on the couch and get even fatter. So there are a whole bunch of different ways of doing that, and they're getting more and more sophisticated. You know, to give you an idea, we're doing some work in, on the Gold Coast at the moment, Gold Coast Waterways Authority. Everyone's got a digital device in their pocket. Big Brother is watching you, you are being tracked. We're getting data off that where we can actually see who's going where, how long they're spending it, how fast they're moving, so we can work it whether they're in a, a powered boat or whether they're in a, in a yacht or a, so forth, and we can actually work out where they're coming from. And so we can start building up a much more robust and quantitative picture of the recreation use of open space and natural areas. Um, Cost benefit analysis, it's a tool that's been around since 1930s. 19, um, it's a tool that's embedded in so much of the work that governments do. You know, different versions of it are used in the corporate sector, you know, they tend to call it business cases and so forth. It's still actually a pretty good tool. It's just that we don't do, use it very well. We tend to be pretty bad practitioners at it. And often that's because of the scope of the values that we consider and the way that we actually value those, you know, put values on those. Um, the reason it's really useful is that it actually starts teasing out what are the marginal changes from our business as usual that we actually get from managing forests or making decisions and so forth. And that's really, really important because at the end of the day, decision makers want to go, I'm going to invest some time, some effort, some money, some public resources into this. What's the change that I should expect? What are the types of changes, both the scope and the, uh, the the scope and the scale of the changes, the timing of the changes, all that sort of thing? So, I still like it as a framework. I just think we need to do it much, much better. A um, little bit of a case study. Um, one of those things about being a consultant is that most projects have a start, a middle, and an end within the space of the same haircut. So whatever we do, it's the 80-20 rule. 
and sometimes it's even more extreme than that. Very rarely would we ever get to do any primary research. So the two case studies here are two little studies that we've done for forestry clients that are within the space of a haircut, each one. And as you can see, I'm not a hippie, so I still have my haircuts reasonably, reasonably regularly. Um, the first one, um, in New South Wales, for New South Wales Forestry Corp, you know, they're reimagining, they're starting a process of reimagining, you know, what the forest estate is to them. And they were really interested in looking at what are the broader values of the forestry estate that they manage on behalf of the people of New South Wales and the people of Australia and also for industry and so forth. And so we started off looking at a whole bunch of different ecosystem services that, are, that could actually come, out of, uh, come out, of the, uh, out of the forestry estate and so forth. Mm -hmm. What data they had, some of that was spatial, some of it was counts, some of it was, it was, it was really, really simple sort of, we, we have permits for this and that and the other and so forth. And it was really just a matter of using the Bob, Bob the Builder toolbox of all the different sort of valuation techniques we could actually use with the data that we actually had to try and pull together some indicative values. Now, it's one of those things that when an economist tells you a number, they are lying, they are wrong. There is never one number. There is never one answer. Douglas Adams was wrong. The answer to the world is not 42. If he's being honest, it's somewhere between 27 and 73. Economics is like that too. And so when you actually get a number coming from an economist, always treat it with a bit of with a grain of salt because there's always going to be assumptions, there's always variability in data, there's always things that they've missed in their, in their analysis. So when we actually went through this sort of process of pulling all this data together, and remember this is... Now this is just a, it's just a desktop exercise. We end up with a really, really wide range of values. And so we use some fancy statistics, you know, stochastic modeling or the technique called Monte Carlo simulations, which, which we can run over all the data points across every single valuation through the whole model. And we end up with a bit of a, bit of a probabilistic range. The key point to sort of note from this is that, you know, the commercial values out of the forestry estate are still pretty big, you know, upwards of $400 million a year. But the value of the other ecosystem services is orders of magnitude greater than the commercial values. And so when we start thinking about that forestry estate, we need to be thinking about managing for all of those values. And this is only a subset. So this is, you know, in terms of scope, this is a vast underestimate. For some of these values, they're probably vast underestimates. So this is really conservative. This is, this, is, this is a project within a haircut time frame. Okay. The other important thing to, to note here is that to, to realise some of those commercial values and realise some of those other values, you need to have a degree of infrastructure, a degree of management, you know, whether it's fire management and so forth. You've got to actually manage the estate. And what tends to happen is that the cost of a lot of that management is not necessarily borne by the same people that actually benefit from it and so forth as well. So you, you do get cross subsidies across the uses, uses and so forth. There's one little case study. Um, the next one was just, we were asked to have a look at a bit of a hypothetical um, tenure change in Queensland. Um, it's about 2.7 million uh, <coughs> hectares of state forest in southeast Queensland. So that's the green bits, the yellow bits of the national parks, effectively. And we were asked to do a bit of a hypothetical in terms of what if you move from a multiple use, use forestry, so there is some extraction in there, but there's other recreational activities, there's other values that are coming out of it and so forth. Um, and what if you turn that into a national park with a strict conservation sort of outcome, okay? And the question was really, what are the trade-offs we need to think about? Because unfortunately economics is all about trade-offs and the world's often all about trade-offs as well. So how might we actually understand some of those trade-offs and value them? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming these slides are gonna get um, uh, distributed because that one there, 
I mean, I haven't had any coffee and I got up at three o'clock in the morning, so that's just a blur for me. But even, though, even for those of you that have very, very good eyesight, nobody's going to be able to read that. But the point is, is that decisions we make about tenure and management have implications for the benefits that can actually be realised. And so when we're making decisions about forestry and you know, public assets, we need to sort of think about those. Can a bureaucrat's pan, a bureaucrat's pan effectively wipe out or increase a realisation of a benefit? And if we go to a hard national park sort of approach, sometimes you can miss out on some of those provisioning services, obviously, but often you can actually miss out on some of those cultural services as well. You can't go riding a mountain bike in a national park. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of things that are non-consumptive sort of uses that probably don't do any damage, probably don't actually cause any, any risk to biodiversity that you could still actually undertake. Um, when we actually sort of have a look at the look at the values, and you can sort of see there's some big wide bars on that. That's that's a that's a bit of honesty from an economist saying, you know, we really don't know what those values are. Um, a couple of things that sort of came out of it, based and you know, some of this is actually limitations on the data that the multiple f use forests tended to have overall higher aggregate benefit streams, and that's because you've got that broader scope of benefits. A big challenge we had in this project is that nobody had actually done any studies in Queensland or for those sort of temperate forests up there on the differences in the ecological values between the two. You know, we, we assume that national parks are providing better ecological values and so forth, um, but we couldn't find any sort of monetary values for that. The other one was actually fire management in terms of the differences there. So there's already, there's, there's big gaps in this sort of work, okay? But in terms of understanding that, that trade-off, there is a gap and we need to sort of think about that trade-off. You know, are we getting another billion dollars worth of benefit, if you like, from going down a very strict conservation tenure versus something that, that has multiple uses? Or is there a middle ground there somewhere? Um, last slide, a couple of observations in, uh, in lessons. You know, we all know it's no, it's no, it's no surprise to any of us how we think about forests is changing, and that's a really, really great thing. Um, economics, in conjunction with other disciplines, even the meat and potato economics that people like me do, can actually provide some assistance and has some value for decision making. Well, I like to think it does anyway, in terms of understanding some of those multiple values, understanding some of the trade-offs, because there will always be trade-offs, and how you might actually provide some insight with some pretty limited data. Um, tenure and management changes have impacts in the way that benefits are realised to, to the community. Um, one of the things across those two studies, very, very different outcomes <coughs> between a Queensland and a New South Wales sense, particularly when we start looking at those social values, and a lot of that's about geography. And so I would just say to everybody, don't think what you do in one part of the world will have exactly the same impact in another. You really need, context is king for all this sort of work, okay? Um, like I talked about before, there's some real low hanging fruit in terms, of, in terms of understanding some of these values better and we're doing some work in recreation at the moment, you know, data from mobile phones and so forth. Um, we will have a much better idea about how the landscape is being used for passive, rec well, you know, non-passive recreation, but you know, non-consumptive recreation and so forth. Um, we really need to think about the winners and the losers. Think about that distribution again. It's really, really important because that's where a lot of our tensions come from. That's where, and understanding that better, that's where a lot of our understanding about how do we actually co-invest, co-manage, all those opportunities, where do they come from? Understanding the distribution to start off with. And really think about how do we explore some of those opportunities for co-investment because the private sector is coming now, I, would, I wouldn't say kicking and screaming. Um, I would have said that 10 years ago. But private markets are emerging and the private sector is getting interested in managing and investing in natural capital. And I think there are some real emerging opportunities there. It's not going to save the world by any stretch of the imagine, uh, imagination, like, you know, but it is making a little contribution. That's it. Thank you.